Hey family, today I'm talking with Kathy Porter. Kathy Porter is a principal and CEO of Porter Brown Associates and Business Fab. That's a media company where she's just doing incredible work. I'm really excited to talk with her around her supplier diversity and inclusion uh, work. She is a professional who delivers not only workshops, but she's also written books. Her books include Billion Dollar Business Boss, and it was nominated for an NAACP Image Award. She also wrote a book called Supplier Diversity for Dummies. And she's going to talk about that with us. And Kathy's business was awarded Small Business Con Subcontractor of the Year in 2020. So she didn't stop growing during COVID. But the important thing that I really want to get into is just how her journey in supplier diversity and inclusion has informed uh, not only her life, but so many others. So I know you're just going to really enjoy this conversation, and I'm so happy to welcome Kathy Porter. Kathy, Kathy, Kathy. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm so happy to have you here. You've got so much to share with us today. I'm, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm so excited. Well, listen, one of the things I really want to make sure we talk about mm -hmm. is um, this I, whole idea of diversity and inclusion. So often I've spoken around the, um, uh, around the thought that we've always had diversity. Inclusion is what we need to lean in on. Mm -hmm. And it's only recently that many organizations and more importantly, many people have mm -hmm. even thought about the idea of in inclusion as a conversation. And mm -hmm. it scares a lot of people. There are mm -hmm. a lot of ways we can go here. Take mm -hmm. us where we need to be. So you're, you're absolutely right. There's been a lot of conversation around diversity and people don't realize that other groups don't always feel included just because you allow them to have entry into the doorway or have entry into job opportunities or have access to contract opportunities. They don't always feel included. They don't always feel welcome. They don't always feel a part of the group. And that's what diversity and inclusion, a large part of it is, is all about. I work with suppliers all the time. And just because you post an, an opportunity out there doesn't mean that they feel welcome to go after it or welcome as a partner. And so we want to make sure with diversity and inclusion that people, not only, not only are you just putting it out there, but you're letting people know, hey, we want you to be here. And that's intentional. And you're right. It's not always easy it's always not a comfortable conversation because there are a lot of things that within ourselves that hold us back from that inclusion, our culture, the way we were raised, who we were, were raised around. And it's not a bad thing. It's just calls for us to talk about it a little bit more and really understand where that's coming from so that we can create solutions. Well, before we go into how you got here and got mm -hmm. to this work, I need you to just stay with this thought for a minute, because yes. when we talk about inclusion, there's mm -hmm. also a big conversation happening right now about white men and how they feel included. And I don't think we can have a reputable conversation on this without talking about everybody's point of inclusion. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk mm -hmm. about uh, 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 a slice of the pie. Mm -hmm. As we continue to iterate in our care and our thoughtfulness, some mm -hmm. feel that the slices of pies are getting thinner. Now, mm -hmm. I tend to say bake more pies, uh, but <laughs> in any event, can we right. talk a little bit, Kathy, from your area of expertise about right. how we look at it? You know, inclusion for all. Well, so... It you touched on a couple of things. We, we white men seem to be the target now. And I think that's because they have historically been in the positions of, of a lot of power in a lot of different industries, a lot of different areas. And so naturally, the, the natural tendency is to go after them. But a part of the inclusion, going back to what inclusion is, it doesn't mean excluding another group. And so we have to figure out, like you say, either make the, big, the pie bigger or make more pies where everyone still feels like they can be a part of it. And so my work with what I do with suppliers and, and business and creating business opportunities, it's not about excluding one group over the other. It's about making room 
for everybody can get so that everybody can get a slice of that pie. We like pie too. So we want everybody to be able to get a piece of pie and not have somebody else that that that's excluded or tell them they can't have any pie. Well, how does data play into how you're helping companies and owners? So data is important. I mean, you can't make decisions. You can't, you don't know where you need to go and what your next step should be without having the right information. And I think for a long time, we've been doing things anecdotally, how it feels and, and how it, it smells and pass the sniff test and all of those things. But you need relevant data to, to really solidify and to give you concrete evidence about what you're doing and what you should be doing. And I think for a long time, especially in supplier diversity, we just didn't rely on data. It was just, we knew what was happening. We knew what was occurring. We could see it. And that's anecdotal information, but you got to have the, the data to support it. And when you're in a business environment, you're talking about contracts, you're talking about all of these things. And to convince people, you have to have that data to support it. So I'm so glad to see now that uh, the, this industry, diversity and inclusion, and supplier diversity, they're looking at metrics, and there are a lot of resources out there to give you that those metrics and that information so that you can make decisions based on facts, not just how you feel or your emotions. Well, you know, you're a key source for that information, which is why <laughs> I'm so intrigued to have you uh, uh, have this conversation. Can you mm -hmm. just share a little bit more about what your work is in a way, perchance, better than I just did? Well, so I, I do feel like my part in this is, is really a small part, but I'm really happy to be able to contribute to the industry in this way. Uh, so I, I wrote a book, uh, Implementing Supplier Diversity, a couple of years ago. It was, and it was, it's a Implementing Supplier Diversity, a driver of entrepreneurship. So it was supposed to be kind of an entrepreneurship book in how small businesses can use supplier diversity programs to help advance their businesses. But now it's turned into so many other things because I, at the time I wrote the book, there wasn't a lot of information out there on supplier diversity. There were a few articles and, and a few, few books, but by and large, they weren't really, and it wasn't really embraced by major publishers. And so my book was one of the first ones out there. And then um, my new book, which is coming out later this year, is coming out in May, actually. It's uh, Supplier Diversity for Dummies. And so it really is a comprehensive book that provides information on how supplier diversity professionals can become better and become a better resource to small businesses. I really believe that uh, it, every small business, in order for them to scale and grow and really move out of that micro stage to a major entity that can have an impact, you have to have customers. You have to have, you have to, you have to be able to make money that that are beyond supporting yourself. You have to be able to have employees and, and grow so that we want to be like Miss you, like you, Miss Janice. We want to be like you. We want to build businesses like you. And in order to do that, you have to have institutional customers. But using supplier diversity, a lot of professionals, they don't always know how to build their program so that they can be impactful for small businesses. And so that's what the new book is about, Implement, um, uh, Supplier Diversity for Dummies. It's a, a resource to help professionals become more effective within their organizations so that they can be more of a resource to small and diverse businesses. That's the only way. That's how we're going to get out of this pandemic uh, financially, economically, is helping businesses become sustainable so that they're around for the long term. And we've got a lot more than the pandemic going on right now. This so is true. This we is have true. a lot of attention to what you're uh, speaking about. But you also have the Supplier Diversity Training Institute. <sighs> Yes. So uh, the, the training institute, we have our next cohort coming up in April. And that, again, that was an idea that came from just thinking about when I started in this industry, there weren't a whole lot of resources for you to go to or people to call. It wasn't like you could just pick up a book and read about it or, or go to a, a course or whatever. And so I thought, I mean, there were workshops out there, but it's general workshops, kind of high level workshops. It really didn't tell you how to become effective. So the Supplier Diversity Training Institute, and we do that with UCF, 
it is really designed to give an academic spin on becoming better at your craft. And so um, it's a, it's a two-day program. We had to break it up. So as of course, with the pandemic, we were supposed to be in person, but with the pandemic, we went virtual, which is, was, has been great. So we broke it up into two days because it's a lot of information. But we really focus on steps that you can take in, in every facet of supplier diversity to become a more effective leader, more respected in your, within your organizations, because now you're giving them real information and tangible information that makes sense to the powers that be, your senior leadership, so that they can support your 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 program and give you uh, the resources that you need to become more effective for for the businesses that you work with well give us a little bit of a cliff note view into <laughs> So cliff notes. So we, we talk about the history of supplier diversity. I have a, a very fortunate to have um, instructor, uh, Dr. Fred McKinney, who's one of the foremost historians on supplier diversity. I'm sure you've seen him at different events as well. And, and just, just coming from a historical perspective, we know the, the Croson um, case and all of those things, which kind of were the, were the catalyst for it, but providing that history as to Everybody why- Everybody doesn't know that though. Maybe you can just talk this about it. This is true. It, it talks about the uh, disparity and uh, one of, uh, there was an issue with uh, a vendor who felt that they were discriminated against. And so that, that became the basis for disparity studies and all of that. But going back to the sixties and why these programs were started, it was due to the riots that were occurring and the government at the time, which was a Republican government, they were trying to come up with solutions to address the economic disparities that existed. And so they gradually gave, uh, put legal language that allowed, um, that forced some of their existing contractors to work with minority businesses and to give them opportunities. So that set the stage for diversity, but it did not set the stage necessarily for inclusion. So you told them what to do, you didn't tell them how to do it. And so we, for a long period of time, we had these programs in place, but nothing was done. And so it wasn't until maybe around the uh, late 80s and 90s that we really started seeing businesses become intentional about their intent. Okay, how do we really make these programs impactful? Because they're not going away. And if we really want to be able to impact these communities, we have to be able to have programs that work. And so we started to see organizations get really intentional, create these programs where businesses could get the acumen that they needed and all of those things. So we talk about the history of supplier diversity, why we have these roles and why we exist. We talk about um, how to get that, how to, how to convince people. So people think that supplier diversity is, is a bunch of lunches and dinners and all of that stuff and breakfasts and awards. And there's so much more. We are in a community. We are our community facing, but we are economic uh, opportunity drivers. Our job is to help businesses and connect them to opportunities. So we really go through, and in doing that, you can have on a lot of different hats. You can be an advocate, you can be an influencer, because you're constantly influencing other people's decisions. You're constantly advocating for small businesses. You're a negotiator, you're a mediator, you're, you're all of these things. So we talk about all of the hats that a supplier diversity a professional might wear in an organization and how do you prepare for that? And so there's nothing to prepare you for that. You just kind of thrown in. And then when you think about how people get into this industry, it's not something you can major in. You can't say, hey, I want to go to school and, and get into supplier diversity. You just kind of Hey, you want to do this job? Yeah, sure, I'll do it. And that's it. And so we want to make people understand how do you prepare for this? How do you prepare to become in to get into this role and become effective? How do I become a, an effective resource for a small business? And for you, I mean, you, your business, you've built this amazing and incredible business, and you have so many people that look up to you. And when you think about who was there to, to help you and organizations that were there, they may not have always been the resource that you needed at the time. And so we want to change that and help people be able to help businesses when they come to them for help. And, and if you don't know what to do, then you're not going to be a resource for them. Well, you know, you make a strong point. There were there and continue to be awesome organizations uh, mm -hmm. 
geared toward supplier diversity that assist large organizations to uh, achieve supplier diversity and inclusion goals. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, handily in MSDC, National Minority oh, yeah. Development Council. Now, I've known that organization since Harriet Michelle was leading it. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. continues to grow. Today, Ying McGuire mm -hmm. is leading it incredibly. Mm -hmm. Then there, uh, we being Women Business mm -hmm. Enterprise and mm -hmm. Um, Pam is uh, Eason leads that mm -hmm. organization. Mm -hmm. WPO, the list mm -hmm. go on of organizations mm -hmm. that are all advocating. You're mm -hmm. so right. When I was growing up, my business though, I found uh, difficulty in how to design my own supplier diversity initiatives, mm -hmm. and we designed pretty much um, from the hip. Now. Mm -hmm. Companies and organizations are all there rushing to help, but mm -hmm. getting solid and getting creditable assistance mm -hmm. is something that I think everybody has a responsibility to do mm -hmm. if you're a business owner. And so mm -hmm. I'm very motivated to have you talk about that a little bit and just to share where you're coming from with that and what your experience is that mm -hmm. enables uh company owners to be mm -hmm. able to work with you. But you got to talk about the billion dollar, 50 billion dollar <laughs> boss. You yes. got to talk about that. Come on, girl. So the 50 billion dollar boss, I'm so excited about that project and the life that it's been able, the, it, it's just taken on a life of its own. So years ago, I um, just me as a young entrepreneur trying to figure out what can I do and what, what resources out there, what's happening in the marketplace. Every day I used to come every evening after work, I would come home and sit in front of my computer, just looking for trends and seeing what was happening in the market. And I was like, I wish there was a resource guide or something that I could read a person's story to see how did they do it, how they did it and all of these things. And then it came to me, oh, maybe I could just write one. Maybe I could, could do this and, and I could be that resource. So I started started this project in, uh, years and years ago, and then um, I, I was trying to, to get it published. And of course, everybody turned it down. But then I finally found a publisher. And it was really important for me to go with a, a major publisher because I viewed this as a business book and a business resource. And so I, I was willing to wait on that right relationship. And so I finally found a publisher. It's a book about African-American Black women entrepreneurs, how they built their business, a uh, million, dollar, million dollar plus business. I got to get you into the $50 billion boss book. We got to hear your story. <laughs> I got to get you in there. But um, that's what the book was about. We were originally looking at celebrity women at the time because everybody's intrigued by celebrities. And it was the publisher who said, hey, why don't you do just regular women and uh, women that that might not their stories might not get told otherwise. And it was the best advice that we could have gotten for the book. And so the book, it profiled these women, how they solved a problem, which is what I was looking for. How did you get money? How did you find your first break? How did you come up with the idea? All of those things. And that's what other women are trying to figure out. How did you do this without any resources, without any help, without any rich grandparents and all of these things just you just it was just from scratch and so these stories have been able to take on a life of their own the book still the book was released maybe five six years ago and it still mm -hmm. continues to to impact people today and um so recently we we launched a 50 bdb website where we sell merchandise um because uh you got to have the merch. And so um, I still do book events some. And now that we're opening back up, I'll be doing some things live and in person. But with the merchandise, a portion of sales will I want to do, we're going to do grants to, I started a $50 billion boss foundation. A portion of sales, we're going to give, just give out grants to Black women entrepreneurs. Just no investment in your business, no, no position on the board, just money to help you move your business to the next level. So if you're trying to prepare for a pitch event or you're trying to, you need to make payroll or whatever it is, 
here's some money to help you do that. Here's some resources to help you do that. And it's those kinds of things that can make all the difference in the world. So it's really exciting to see all of this interest in Black women entrepreneurs. When I when the book first came out, nobody was thinking about Black women entrepreneurs. I went to foundations. I went to all of these places. We tried to get sponsors for book tours and book events. Nobody was interested. They thought it was cute and oh yeah, it's nice. Nobody was interested. Fast forward five years later, now everybody wants to help black women. And I think it's great. I think that um, when you think about, and, and, and it's, we, were, we were the first ones in the book looking at trends and black women dropping out of the workforce and starting their businesses and all of that. And so now you, you're seeing people, they just want an opportunity to do their own thing, call their own shots, be there for their families, impact their communities and not have all of this extra pressure and so I think it's great that people are, are now really paying attention to Black women entrepreneurs and the contributions they contribute to this economy to keep it going and moving forward. And uh, I'm really excited that we, we have an opportunity to impact Black women in this way. Well, you, you know, you've got a new uh, course out. How much of the book is in the course? How much are you teaching? How do they, how do they work together? Yeah. So the course, I'm, I'm always about, of course, entrepreneurship. I'm always about helping you win contracts. So the course is uh, Business Fab Academy. And with Business Fab Academy, we teach you how to develop an institutional strategy. So if whatever your business is, whoever you're selling to, whatever it is. So if you're selling, you have widgets and you're trying to get into a Target or get into a Walmart, we help you to develop an institutional strategy so that you can go from selling them at a flea market or whatever to selling them in a, a brick and mortar store. How to position your business, how to your position your idea, how to market to that institution. So it, whether, it, whether your services, construction, whatever that is, how to get these large institutions to you as a customer, because it's much easier to scale a business when you're selling in bulk and you're selling several and you're getting a contract to sell several rather than selling one at a time. You can't, it's, it's very difficult to scale a business when you're only selling one. So we help you take whatever it is you're doing how to expand it. Maybe you you not selling um, your widgets. Maybe you have to expand to include something else that appeals to an institutional customer. So that's what the, the course is. And we're looking to add additional courses. We get requests all the time about some of the different things as being a part of that because it's it's not... It's, it's a lot more involved than, okay, I take this course and then we'll be able to, to do this, but you, you still have to do some other little things. And so we're looking to add additional content to address all of those little things to help you become more effective in, in getting contracts. And I think every business, you can have your retail side, and, but you also want to have an institutional side where you're selling to larger clients. So it doesn't, it doesn't mean one or the other. It's both. You can have both and have a really successful business. So when you have things like the pandemic that comes in, now you're you're working with one group and, and maybe not the other group and then vice versa. So it helps you to build out your portfolio, even it out a little bit so that you're not has impacted when things disruptions like this come along. Well, I've got to get you connected with some of the organizations I mentioned to you before, because they do amazing work. And I know they'd enjoy having you uh, be a part of some of what they're doing. Uh, but, you know, so many of our listeners are young women starting businesses. Mm -hmm. Not all of them are African-American. So not all of them are black. Mm -hmm. So uh, how does your book work for them as well? Well, so I'm glad you mentioned that because I work with entrepreneurs across the board. I've had uh, my, my books have, are not just for for black women. I've had people of all races come to my book events or buy the book or support the book because that's the other the piece to it is that it talks about how these women solved a problem. They just happen to be black. And of course, I wanted the book to focus on black women, but uh, it also is a resource to how they solve the problem. So I've had book events where people found value in that information. It just happens to be from the, uh, the, the perspective of a black woman entrepreneur. So right, like Dr. Kismakia Corbett. 
Yeah, yeah. It's, a it's, black woman uh, is certainly solving a big problem, helping absolutely. to solve the problem. And if, so it, it's, it doesn't mean just because the face is one way that it's not still a resource for someone else. And so it's still a resource guide. It's still information and, and just gives you a different perspective than people are probably used to. And I think uh, one of the things that it was really profound that's always stuck with me is that the publisher said, these stories need to be told. And so when, when you think about these stories in, in our stories, in, in, in our whole stratosphere, if we don't tell our stories, then people will, will may never know, they may never hear them. And so I thought uh, that always stuck with me and, and it's really been guiding what we do and the work that we're continuing to do. And so still being able to tell our stories, but still be able to be a resource for everybody. It's just just a different perspective. And we need and telling those stories, stories. Telling those yeah. stories can be so inspiring as well. Yeah. I mean, I can think of so many women who mm -hmm. inspire across mm -hmm. race and mm -hmm. across color and mm -hmm. across gender. So yeah. I love that you were able to talk about that because um I think it was so underserved all of us if mm -hmm. uh, you left this conversation mm -hmm. with the idea that your books are only written for black. no not at all i've i've had numerous people and then working in the public sector i work with everybody i work with any and all people and so and and i, I really struggled with the book initially because like oh do i want it to be all women or black women or, or what what because for so, for so long, my work was everybody, but I, my, my publisher, we just really nailed down, we, we need to tell these stories. And so it's okay. It's, it's fine. And so that's how we ended up uh, where we were with the book. But, I love that. I yeah. love that. that yeah. Nobody told about Madam C.J. Walker. I would not know. And that was such an inspiration to me. So I think that's an yes, inspiration I, for all of us. Yeah, that story is an inspiration for all of us, and it continues to be an inspiration. And there were so there were some women that were her peers. They may not have been as no, uh, didn't have as much notoriety, but there were some women that were right along with her that that yeah. had financial resources and. And to your point, we didn't write their stories. Nobody yeah. wrote their stories. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but you know, Kathy. Take this moment and write your story for us. Mm. Tell us about you. Take us back to when you found life or when you were brought to life. Sure. So uh, I, I'll, I'll get to the, the highlights. I grew up and born and raised in Philadelphia. And then um, my mother moved back, like so many people, they in the city and then moved back to the country. Country folks moved to the city and then they decided they didn't like it. They decided to move back. So my mother moved back to the country in Georgia. So I was raised. We have a big family farm. And at the time, I wanted nothing more than to get away from the farm. I did not want to be. Well, how old were you when you when she uh, she moved you from Philadelphia? So I was probably maybe a preteen, so about 12, 13 years old. Oh so, wow. Okay. City girl, raised in the city, hard concrete, all of that, and then coming back to the country. It was kind of culture shock. But I, I'm in in hindsight, in retrospect, I'm so glad that um I was raised in in that environment, slower environment, just a whole totally different environment. And, and so that city life can be really hard living. And so coming back to the country where we did everything, we had animals, my mother, she had chickens and she had geese and cows and all of that stuff. And so we, we were very, and then having a garden and raising vegetables. Wait a minute, this. she had a farm or she had animals? We had we have a we had a farm we had an, an actual farm and was so, it a black owned farm? Yes, yes. Is it alive today? Yeah, we my my stepfather still is there. My mother's no longer with us, but um, now that's a story you got to write too. <laughs> there's you a know, lot of uh, there's a lot of rally for black farmers right now. She, uh, he my my uncles they all. Had, were uh, farmers and they would supply um, 
collard greens and vegetables to stores and all of that stuff. And I had an uncle, he raised hogs and sold them to market. We had neighbors that had the big chicken houses and sold it to, sold chicken to the, the poultry plants and all of that stuff. And so we were raised around that all the time. Did the farm you know, have a name? No, no, it was just, just kind of our little thing. Um, and then they would sell the cows to market and all of that. And so we, it was just, just kind of how we lived. And so it's funny now when you see farm to table and we just called mm -hmm. it living, <laughs> we just mm -hmm. called it living yeah. and yeah. eating. We didn't call it anything, but little did we know we, we had farm to table long before it became a thing. And oh, so, my girlfriend, um, listen, you're going to love this, mm -hmm. Kathy. Okay. My girlfriend um has a farm now mm -hmm. she and her husband and she delivers incredible incredible poultry products and meat mm -hmm. products market mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. over covid it mm -hmm. has been a really really interesting thing to ah. see people are rushing to her Oh yeah, absolutely. My we used to have eggs, and my mother would sell the eggs. And my mother, she made jelly, and she she used to do all of that stuff. And we over the summer, that's all we did. We had the cream corn, and we had to stew tomatoes and cut okra and collard greens, and we just hated it. I hated watering and all of that stuff. And so, but and then when she passed, now no none of us can make any jelly. We don't know how to do it. So, <laughs> but. <laughs> But, but um, we can't laugh about that. That's so sad because yeah. uh, many of us have lost those old skills, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can't make we we would always help her, but I her special recipe, I couldn't do it to save my life. And so that that's gone and it's not something I can pass down to my daughter and or anything like that so it, it died with her and she was the only one in the family that could do it and so she sold jelly on the weekends eggs jelly all of that stuff so all of that is gone now but um but I, I remember all of those things and all of that fondly now, but um, because I don't have it. And so every time she would come to town, she's bringing vegetables to everybody. And they're like, oh, when is your mother coming? So that was always an, an interesting thing. But I uh, grew up on the farm, went to an HBCU for college, uh, right out of college. Went shout to it out, girl, shout it out. Savannah State down in, <laughs> uh, in Savannah, Georgia, one of the oldest HBCUs in the country. And so I graduated from Savannah State and went to work in marketing. My background is marketing. I was product management for a, a major hair care brand, multicultural marketing. So I was I worked for Dark and Lovely for many, many years. A lot of people don't realize Dark and Lovely was made and manufactured right there in Savannah, Georgia. And so I got a job in marketing and had a chance to travel all over moved to Revlon, moved to New York and worked for Revlon for a little while. And then um, left. You there. were in that beauty business, huh? I was in the beauty, beauty industry. Yes. And so that was, that was my formulate formulative years. And that really, when, when I mentioned uh, Madam CJ Walker, that was right up your line. Oh yeah. Yeah. And hair care. You can't be in hair care and not know Madam CJ Walker. So you cannot be in, in hair care and, and that she not be in, especially a black woman in hair, in hair care and not yeah. have her as a, 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 an idol for you, a role model for you, what could right. be. So I uh, left there and, um, and really just trying to figure out what my next step was going to be. Uh, had a couple of businesses for a little while that, you know, just trying to figure it out, didn't really do anything, but I, I ended up working for a construction firm. How, I do not know. Was, they were a family friend and they needed some temporary help. And so when I, I worked with them for a little while and they were building a major construction project, uh, um, a big convention center. And so I handled all of the subcontractors that they had on the project. And after that, uh, someone came to me and said, hey, we have this opportunity in managing our small business program. And that was my entry into uh, divert working in diversity. And so working with, working with that small company, that's how I ended up getting a job in uh, supplier diversity and working with contractors and helping them get contracts on projects. And so I've been there ever since. 
Well, you know, you talked to, we talked about farms and mm -hmm. I mentioned my girlfriend over COVID. I got to tell you, I got some, I was really fortunate. Shiner Gold Star Ranch is her company. You oh, should okay. her up uh, mm -hmm. if your family's still in farming. She's doing some really smart things there. Her name That's is nice. Kimberly. And she and her husband are doing some really good things at Shiner Gold Star Ranch. And mm. their food is just awesome. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I want you to connect them, okay? I, Get I love going to those farms and especially if they have a restaurant now and a lot of them they have the little it might it might only seat maybe 10 people in there and they have the longest wait list because everything is fresh from the farm and so it's it's I, I love doing and that. if you had kept that recipe they could be getting your jelly <laughs> you know what I I yeah yeah and yeah I'm sure you guys made all kinds of condiments. She did pepper relish, and and it's it's funny because it's all the stuff that you see on the shelf now. So it's like we used to make this, we used to make this, we used to make all of this stuff. And Those old mason jars. Did you use the old yep, mason jars? Yep. Yep. She, so all of the packaging, even the packaging that you see, we used to do all of that. So we we could have done that, and and at one time we toyed with the idea, hey maybe let's take this to market that didn't work out but um all the stuff that we used to do for years and you see on the shelf now we used to do all of that yeah oh my goodness well, I when, know I know when you went to uh when you went to university were you an on-campus student no. <laughs> No. So I tell How this did story. I know to ask? <laughs> I tell this story when I'm uh when I'm doing speaking engagements, I always tell this story to, to get some laughs. And so I started out um at a little private college in um uh, in Georgia. And my first time away from home, I'd never been away from home before. So I was like, oh, who, who gets you up to go to class and do all this stuff? Oh, you do it yourself. You, you, you're here. So first time away from home, country girl, all of this stuff. So I didn't know you had to go to class every day and so uh, and do work. And oh, I'm, I was smart in high school. I'll be all right. And I think, oh, I'll study the night before. It'll be fine. And so it wasn't always fine. And, and when you don't go to class they, and you fail, they put you on something called academic probation and they tell you don't come back and so so my first year of college I flunked out and, and so um I ended up going to the National Guard so my parents were like oh you're not going to sit around here and I ended up going to the National Guard I thought they would stop me but they said oh no okay we love it so I went and so I went to the to the army and um I was just there, okay, I'm killing some time until I could go back to school, make a little bit of money, get me a car and all of that stuff. But it was one of the most life-changing experiences that I ever had because you're, you're around all of these types of women from all of their reasons for joining the military, whatever it is. A lot of them is like, I need this for my kids. This was kind of their last hope their last lifeline and for me i was just there because i got kicked out of school and was trying to to get a car and mm. so i but it was also kind of life-changing in that it was the first time that i really had an opportunity to see leadership skills that i had that i didn't know because nobody had ever really developed them and so i was a little squad leader i, I won a badge for firing i won a sharpshooter badge and, and all of that stuff so i could shoot my weapon and um oh go ahead no, please, please. No. And so, but but coming back, coming out of that experience and coming back and going back to school, that's when I transferred to Savannah State, just had a whole different mindset, a different focus. Okay, you have to get serious about school if, if you want to graduate from school. And so going to class and then I, at that time, my parents had stopped paying for it. So I had to pay for it myself. So I had my GI Bill, I had jobs. So it, it was just one of those things that really, I, I think I grew up during that time. So going back to school and then graduated and, and then having a plan while you're in school, what are you gonna do after school? Okay, I, okay you gotta get a job. So where are you, where are you gonna work? What, what are you gonna do? What do you like to do? And that's how I ended up in marketing. So before I even um, graduated, excuse me, 
I spent six months building relationships with the organization. Hey, I'd love to come in and doing just interning with them. And then I, I, after I went, I got a job there with Carson Products. And then I think within a year, I got promoted and kept just kept getting promoted. And then they had me traveling. I had a small brand that I was managing. And so I don't know if I would have had that career trajectory had I not been kicked out and not gone to, to the military. It really just straightened me out, straightened me up. And I, I realized I'm not the type of person that can just slouch around and just let things happen. But I wouldn't have known that had I not gone to the military. So many of my friends, my especially my uh, lady friends who've been in the military, offer some of the best advice, give mm -hmm. some of the best support, and really have uh, great lives. And you know, they to a to a person, they credit that their time in the military just taught mm -hmm. them how to live. And yeah. I don't think that's a message a lot of people get about service in the military. And I bring that up because, you know, we're in a particular time in our world right now. And we look at military service as only war service or only fighting service. But military service encompasses so much. Over COVID, a lot of people mm -hmm. got a really different idea about what the military does and how mm -hmm. it supports us in times of uh, difficulty, uh, as well as yeah. times of peace. Well, I, I, tell, I tell every young person, hey, if you're not sure what you want to do, you might want to think about the National Guard, think about the military. A lot of them are, oh, I don't know, because they're scared to go to war. I say, well, I mean, how often does that happen? <laughs> it's not really likely to happen. Although we have the conflict now, it's really not likely to happen. So they let those types of fears prevent them from this opportunities. But when I, I went, I got my GI Bill, which paid for my school. I graduated debt-free, which a lot of kids, especially our kids, they graduate with so much debt. And so, and which help, which harms you, you're not able to do the things that you wanna do because you got bills to pay, you got student loans to pay. And so I graduated debt-free. I bought my first house when I was 26 years old. And, and now, uh, 20, 30 something years later, we're a certified veteran owned business. And so these benefits just keep on keeping on and have, have gone with me throughout my entire career. In addition to the things that you just said, those skills, in that uh, mindset helped tremendously. And so many, I remember the National Guard coming into uh, my hometown during Hurricane Floyd. And mm. it was my first real strong awareness of the National Guard. Mm. Although one of the major National Guard recruitment centers is on campus at my university and HBCU, North mm -hmm. Carolina A&T State University. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. boy. Um, <laughs> You know, as we're going through uh, 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 a reinvention of how education looks, I don't think anything will supplant the value that students get for being on campus. And mm -hmm. I asked you, were you an on-campus student? I do think that's very helpful, but a mm -hmm. lot of education is distance learning now. And I don't know where uh, the National Guard or the military um, um, will be in line with that type yeah. of education. Yeah, we uh, education is is changing so much, and and I mean just from how they get how they recruit students to how they keep students on, and now with this pandemic, everybody went home, and now it's all virtual and and all of that, and so the education industry is in such flux. And I saw where they were saying that uh, higher education they might lose five to ten percent of their students that may not come back at all. And so when you think about how the especially large institutions and how they grow and how they much they depend on that influx of students every year to maintain these buildings, they're building buildings, they're doing all these things and they're a major economic engine. If you don't have those students coming in every year, that's that's detrimental. That that becomes almost crisis level for them. And so I don't know how this pandemic is going to impact the education industry. And, and you know, you and I know if it hurts the, the big guys, it hurts HBCUs even more. 
And so each HBCUs feel it a whole lot more. So it's going to be interesting to, to see um, how this all shakes out. My daughter, she, she lived on campus. She, no, she didn't live on campus, but um, she didn't live on campus. She had an apartment, but she was, she was always on campus, but she, um, she, she did live at home for a little while. So it's, it's been that long since my daughter uh, graduated from, from, from college, but um, she was always on campus. And so she, she always says that was a regret that she had not living on campus for, for a period of time. Yeah. The the the, the uh, coedness of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Really oh yeah. I, I I absolutely agree. You lose some element of that when you're not living on campus. You're just kind of a, an adult going back and forth and popping in and out of campus. So you absolutely lose some of that. Well, I don't want to lose anything in terms <laughs> of uh of your sharing. So I'm going to do what I call four for four. Okay, I'm ready. I'm ask you four questions, and mm -hmm. you're going to give me four answers to each. And okay. here's the thing: um, four answers to each question. Four answers to each question. Okay. okay. Um, so the first one, let's go one for four. Mm -hmm. You're hosting a dinner party. Mm -hmm. I think you can invite anybody from any time in history till now. Mm -hmm. To your dinner party who are the four people you're inviting okay so i have to start and with why uh, and why remember why is part of the answer okay so of course i have to to ask uh, madam cj walker just because she's such a legend and how does she have the foresight and the will and the tenacity to do what she did considering everything that she went through which means that none of us have an excuse we there's no reason why um, Oprah, because, uh, I mean, Oprah is, Oprah is the queen of, of all media. She, she started out in a small market and became the, the big, uh, behemoth that she is today. And so we'd love to get some insights from her. Uh, Michelle Obama, I just love that story. And, um, I mean, we, we know their impact being the first people, uh, people of color in the White House and what that meant for her. And, and of course, you, you would be on that list. Oh, I'll help you. I'll be in the kitchen helping you cook those <laughs> recipes you don't remember. Get somebody else at Get somebody table. else. Uh, let's see. Who else? I, I'm a big uh, biographies person. And so, um, hmm. I don't know. I, 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 you kind of stumped me on that one. I already had you in mind. Ah. And so, yeah. So um, I, I'll give you my strong three and you're my fourth possible. So I'm going to get somebody to take your place in the kitchen and have you come over. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, certainly with your other guests, I'll be delighted to join. Okay. Fantastic. Awesome. Okay. So what four different music or authors are you listening to now and why? Music or authors or just both? Well, music may be genre driven or okay. it may be artist driven. Okay. Uh, so with music, I'm, I'm, I'm very eclectic in a, a little new age. And so, um, I mean, I like my classic R&B from the 80s, you know, uh, from the 90s. Uh, Mary J. Blige is having a huge resurgence, and so loving that. I always love uh, Jill Scott because I like to mellow out and vibe out. I Those love, eggs in the morning. <laughs> yes. I'm loving um, Jasmine Sullivan right now. Just, mm -hmm. just lo always loved her, and I like her. I love her. Now, is Jackie Sullivan the one who broke the car window? Yes, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. She gonna, <laughs> yeah. You always got to have somebody like that on your squad. <laughs> you got somebody that's going to break the windows and let people know sometimes. So, so yeah, and, and listening to her right now, too. But And there, there are so many others. I mean, it's just a lot of good music coming out. That's sometimes. three, though. Give me four. I gave you four. Mary J., Mary uh, J. J Jill Scott, Jasmine yeah. Sullivan, and her. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's four. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, how about books? What four books 
would you advise our listeners to read that really impacted you and why? So I'm glad you asked that question. One of the first books that I'm really excited about that I'm reading right now is Poise for Excellence. It's by uh, Karima Mariama, author. And it's, it's a book on leadership and it really just talks about leadership principles and how to become a more effective leader. I love that. And she's a black woman author. And so you don't really find a lot of black women writing leadership books. And so I was really, I'm really excited about that. Another book that I'm reading right now, Leadership Is It, The Work of Leaders. This just talks about how to align, how to, how to get people, to your people to follow you and fall in line with your vision for your business. Um, right now, I'm also looking at uh, managing by the numbers. I'm not a numbers person by nature, and, but you need to be when you're managing, uh, running a business. And so being able to get more comfortable in that space and not just have your accountant handle it. And because that's when you run into problems and all your money might be gone. And then uh, <laughs> duct tape marketing. And so with all of the, the things that are going on in the marketplace and everybody, oh, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. How do you create a, a marketing process that works for you? And so just reading that to just get more comfortable and about developing a marketing strategy that works for me. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Those are going to be some really helpful books. You yeah. didn't throw novels in there. So you're serious. You're on your business right, right now. Right now, I don't have time to read novels. I used to read novels. And, and because I'm reading books and, and mm -hmm. facilitating stuff all the time, it's usually textbook driven. But when I do have some downtime, it's not even novels. I just want to read like gossip stuff. And so... <laughs> mindless something I don't have to think about or, or any of that even with the novel you have to think a little bit so I like mindless gossip stuff when I have a little bit of free time you know Kathy one of the things I noticed is that so many of my guests actually have the books as well they're not like kindling it or you know they're actually getting the books I guess that feeling that feeling yes. That's, that's old school. I, I, I can't get into scrolling on uh, my iPad to read. I have to have the physical book. And so uh, in my library, I have uh, bookshelves and I have books. I have books from college, mm -hmm. textbooks from college. Even when I was in school and I just, I just graduated in uh, December from, from a, a master's uh, in entrepreneurship program at UF. I never got my books online. I had to have the physical book. And so it's just something about turning the pages and highlighting the pages. I just, it just feels natural. So I'm, I'm old school like that. Yeah. Well, girl, I ain't, I ain't fighting you on that. We're going four for four now. Okay. Okay. Kathy, you, and you share so much, mm -hmm. but are the four best pieces of advice you've ever received in your life who gave you the advice and why was it so important that you share it? Oh, I've been very, very fortunate. So um, I have a, a lot of people in my corner that I go to for different things. And so probably the best uh, business advice was make sure you watch your money, keep your eyes on your money. And that came from, she's, uh, she's a mentor now, um, Wanda Smith. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's, that's a, a good piece of advice. Uh, my mother, she's always, was always giving me good advice. And she said to just go after it. Don't just don't worry about uh, what the repercussions are. And, and I can say that, um, if I had thought about some things too much, I probably wouldn't have done them. And so being able to just go out there, very fortunate that she raised us where we, we didn't have to, we weren't burdened with a lot of other things. We could just go after what we wanted. And so having that freedom and, and that flexibility and a lot of people ask, well, what has been your secret? I've, I've always been able to just go after it. If it comes into my head, I could go for it. And so that was my mother. Um, I had a, a mentor that um, when I, my, one of my first jobs when I was at Savannah State, and she was one of the first Black store owners in the mall 
in um, in Savannah, and she would always say um, to to just have some have pride in what you do, no matter what it is you're doing. So if, even if we were dust in the store, or she was real meticulous about the store and how it was presented, because as the the first and at the time only black store owners in the mall she wanted the store to be perfect at all times. And so no matter what we were doing, we were representing the store. And so she would always say, just have some pride in what you're doing and no matter what it is. And so that always stuck with me. And, you know, sometimes people, when you're, you're very, when you have a very particular vision about how you present yourself and how you present your work. You get labeled a lot of different things. Oh, she's mean, oh, she's this, oh, she's that. But she was, she just had a vision for her business and she stuck to it. And if you wanted to work with her, that was how you're going to, to work. And there were no shortcuts. There was no, no in between. And then, um, so I, I really appreciated that because that's set the stage for how I work today. Just, just strong work ethic and, and always just keeping that in mind. And then the last piece was, um, it was always enjoy what you do. And so that came from that. I, I probably I got that from I think during my when I was in the military, and I think it was one of the drill sergeants, and um, I can't remember their name at the time, but their name. But it was one of the drill sergeants, and they were like, "Enjoy what you do," because when you're in that environment and in that moment. We hated PT. We hated having to get up in the mornings. We hated all of it. But looking back, and, and again, that time period helped to frame me as well. So there are some things that I, I'll do and I have um, interns and they'll be like, oh, I'm tired. And how do you keep going? I'm like, this is light work. This is, this is nothing compared to some of the other stuff that I've had to do and just going and going and not stopping and not taking a break, which is probably not good. But just just having fun and, and just going for it and, and all of those things. And so I've been able to take just different things from my journey and, and really apply them to all aspects of my business. And that's really been the secret to why we've been able to do a lot of the things that we do. Well, that is awesome. <laughs> Coming from you, it has to be followed. If people want to follow in your footsteps, you you've just really enlightened me and I've enjoyed this so much and certainly I hope you have. Absolutely. I am I'm honored to to be here with you this afternoon. Well, from my heart to your home. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you so much, Ms. Janice. Thanks for having me. <laughs>